Your paper is due April 13th, two weeks from the night. You had no reading assignment for that night, and so we will not have class on oh, that night. It's Holy Thursday, and some of you are going to want to go to services, but all of you should bring your paper either before that time or at that time to my office in Augustine. Now, does everybody know where Augustine is? My office is 101 Augustine. And the papers are due at 7 o'clock, April 13th. I don't want papers emailed to me because it's too hard to keep up with them. So whether your paper is entirely finished or not, turn it in at that time. Does everybody understand where? At class time, then it's due in Augustine. 101 is a plastic box outside the office. All right, let's say just a, a little bit about the paper. When we ask you to use outside sources, we don't mean that they have to be exactly on your topic, because you're not likely to find sources on which a novelist writes as much as to what it is that he writes about. A writer can make an insignificant novel out of the most profound ideas, but it comes to nothing. Ideas do not make novels, nor do interesting characters or lively plots. <coughs> what makes a serious novel, one that has the stature of genuine art, is the language the rendering of objects and thoughts, the form, by which I mean the embodied insight. If you care about a person, it's not just that person's ideas that you love. You know, it's the very movement and shape of the person itself. His appearance, the way he acts, how he talks, the look in his eyes, so it is with the work of poetry. It's the body of the poetry itself. It's the sound of it in your ears. And of course you don't have time when you're reading a, a novel, a long novel, to read it aloud. But you do hear it inside you. You have an interior uh, sense that hears that and hears it rather quickly. But real literature is written for the ear and not for the eye. And so those of us that are in literature need to know how to tell good literature from bad. And we can't just go by the, its ideas, but it's by that embodiment of the ideas. Now I speak about Dostoevsky's art in writing because as profound as his ideas are, they would not be profound if they were not expressed in language that goes straight to the soul, even in translation. We sense that, and a good translator is able to capture that quality. His paradoxes, his irony, the grotesque and surprising way in which he presents his characters, his ability to make us see the contradictory aspects of humanity, including ourselves. All this is dependent upon his technique and his style. Someone could have some of these same ideas and just write them you know, as a, a kind of straightforward account of ideas and it could be a bad novel. So I think we have to think about that because those of us that love literature and that are interested in literature are, in a sense, guardians of it. And so we can't be taken in just by ideas. But it's that embodiment of them, it's presenting them to us in images so that 
we see and hear. And this is what the novelist Joseph Conrad said was his purpose. He said to make you see, to make you feel, to make you hear, to make you smell. You know, the, the senses are glorious and they are uh, exhilarating in the hands of someone like a Shakespeare or a Dostoevsky or a Faulkner or a Homer. So we test an author's real genius against our ear for the art of language is oral and our job is to get it off the print page and into our inner ears that place where we hear the exact way that Hamlet was meant to sound when he says to be or not to be. That is the question. So when you pick up a novel that seems to take itself seriously, test it against your ear. Spend some time with its very first page. Does it use language simply as though it's meant for the eye, just to get ideas across? the way journalists write? Or does it realize the inner oral nature of language? Now I wanted to say all this to you before this course is over. For it's not simply ideas that we're learning from Dostoevsky, but it's embodied realities. It's not interesting characters even that we encounter so much as objective pluralities that allow us to complete the characters in our own imaginations. We know Alyosha, for instance, from images that have been impressed on our inner sight. We don't know what he looks like. I don't think we even try to bother to picture it. Do you? I don't. All these years of thinking about him, and I've never really tried to picture what he looked like. But we know him intimately. Nevertheless, it's not a literal picture that we get it's from a film. That's why we're disappointed when our favorite novels are made into films, because there's no image that can do justice to that image in the imagination, which is never quite a picture. <coughs> so when Father Zosima tells us the story of his life and allows us to share in his final sermon, what he says is all impressed on our memories and our hearts so that we're changed by him. Dostoevsky writes in a manner that reaches our interiority and it's largely a matter of incarnation. His inner vision had to find the right form for its embodiment and that's what took him so long in his writing and caused him such agony. But modeling, as I think he does, on the style of the New Testament, he has found a way to reach our inner selves and to change us. Now, last time we spoke of the theme of suffering in the Brothers Karamazov. Falling to the earth and dying so that we give forth much fruit. And certainly that's one of the chief topics of this novel. And perhaps we could, still, we could still say its main concern. But in this middle section of the novel, what we shall see is the working out of what causes most of us, what causes most of our suffering in this life. That's what this middle section is showing us. What is it that gives us our most excruciating anguish and actually breaks us unless we find some way through it. What is it that makes us fall to the earth and die? If not some violation of our very nature, what is it that makes us feel that we're in the right and that the world is wrong, so much so that we're willing to be virtually destroyed on the question? Now, Dostoevsky would show us in this section that it's our yearning for justice. That's the real theme of this middle section of the novel. Please pardon my horses. It hasn't gone away yet, so I'm sorry. I hope you can hear me. Now, all the Karamazov brothers are in search of justice. 
I must have justice, Yvonne says, or I will destroy myself. And Dimitri seeks justice. And even the general Alyosha demands justice from God for his sainted elder Zosima. Dostoevsky picks up this theme, one of the great ones from the literary and spiritual tradition. You remember that Job calls out to God for justice and that he finds instead the mystery of love and the mystery of the whole cosmos governing a universe more complicated and strange than he could have ever imagined. Shylock demands justice and finds the quality of mercy is not strained. Lear expects justice and finds the overwhelming reality of Cordelia's love. Ahab in Moby Dick struggles angrily with God over the question of justice, as does Iago in his resentment of Cassio's being appointed to the lieutenantship. Ultimately, we see it's justice that Satan demands in Paradise Lost. With his sense of what he calls injured merit, and his resentment of the power of the good. And Father Zosima then tells us in this novel, he says of the social planners, they aim at justice and they will end by flooding the world with blood. Now we need to think about that because it certainly has come true in our time. They aim at justice and they will end by flooding the world with blood. We all long for justice until we give up on our own narrow visions of reality. So just so the three brothers want justice, and they must, during the course of the novel, fall to the earth and die over that issue. And we soon see the universality in this novel, as we see it in all great literature. It's, it's not just one particular family that the novel's about, but the family of Russia, and finally the family of humankind, ourselves. We're all Karamazov. We've seen that each of the three brothers has come home to the Karamazov estate, seeking justice. Dmitri wants his monetary inheritance. Yvonne, too, seeks his rights. Alyosha seeks some kind of spiritual justice for his mother, the beautiful, suffering young woman that he remembers holding him up to the icon of the sacred Theotokos, the mother of God. The chief portion of the novel that overtly concerns the theme of justice is the portion that's most famous. And that's the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, which is sometimes simply lifted out of the novel and printed by itself in textbooks. And it is presented as representing Dostoevsky's views on the question. Now, that is a great error. And I hope all of you will do all you can in the world to offset that error of saying that this is what Dostoevsky believes confronts us. You see, either the meek and gentle, inefficacious Christ or the powerful Grand Inquisitor. This is Yvonne's view of our choice, not Dostoevsky. Now, in this legend of the Grand Inquisitor, Dostoevsky has pictured then a meek Christ, completely vanquished, in the political order by a powerful and benevolent atheist dictator who represents the church. Now this section is many times read in isolation, as we've said. But we've got to see that it is not that passive resistance of the Christ of the Grand Inquisitor that Dostoevsky wants us to understand. He wants us to see behind this into the mind of Yvonne. Now the terrible question that it raises is the possible impotence 
of Christ. Can Christianity do anything in this world other than speak of an afterlife where all is made right? Does Christianity offer merely the next world as compensation for a life lived in poverty and misery here below? Does it offer as consolation for those who are tortured only a higher harmony in which all, including the torturer, are forgiven? Is heaven built on the tears of innocent victims, as Yvonne says? Is the Christian impotent in the face of evil? It's this higher harmony of an afterlife that the intellectual brother, Yvonne, rejects. As he tells Alyosha, he must have justice. And so he returns the ticket. Now, we're all given a ticket, he's, he's implying, uh, for heaven, for the other world. He says, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want your other world. I return your ticket. And he insists to Yvonne, it's not that I don't believe in God, he says. Now we have to decide whether we think he does or not. But he says, it's not that I don't believe in God. I simply don't approve of his world. And I won't accept it. And so I'll return the ticket. Now the confrontation between the two four brothers, Yvonne and Alyosha, is the pivotal point of the book. Their mother, the young woman who was mistreated by old Fyodor, their father, was named Sophia, Holy Wisdom, the one who loves, the one who comes to our aid, who contains the wholeness of things, Holy Wisdom. At this crucial stage of their lives, these two brothers look into each other's eyes and I think we need to picture their gaze as kind of iconic. You know, it frames the whole novel. Behind them are two old men. You know, the Grand Inquisitor on one side and Father Zosima on another, and these two full brothers gazing into each other's eyes, attempting to know each other, because they do know each other. Their gaze contains, at this moment, their whole souls. Yvonne, with his thirst for justice and his tender heart, his Euclidean mind, his misunderstanding of love, his hope to save mankind, and Alyosha, with his untested spirituality. We talked last time about his being naive, about thinking how easy it would be for Father Sosima's love and goodness to conquer the world. So Alyosha is still naive here. Alyosha with his untested spirituality, his innocence, and yet his truth, and his very real love. So behind these two, as I say, stand the two old men, two seemingly benevolent figures, who would help the human race as much as possible. Elon's Grand Inquisitor, whom he has invented in his fable, a fictitious cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, and Alyosha's very real Father Zosima, the representative of Russian Christianity. On this encounter depends not only the structure of the novel, but the outcome of Dostoevsky's prophetic vision. And so it has been much misread. It's probably done much damage. I don't know what we think when we, when we have to face the fact that perhaps Nietzsche uh, misread Dostoevsky's image of Christ. Is Dostoevsky responsible for that? Well, I think Nietzsche would have gone that way on his own, but nevertheless, I think he did misread Dostoevsky. But what readers of this section have neglected to see is that Yvonne, as we've said, is the author of this fiction, not Dostoevsky. 
This is a fictional character, the Grand Inquisitor, who unburdens his heart to us with what we can see our no, Ivan is a fictional character who unburdens his heart to us so that we can see by the way things turn out what's wrong with Ivan. <clears throat> this is called the argument from design, the argument from structure. Ivan's dilemma, now not Dostoevsky's, is what we call a false dilemma because it does not truly state all the alternatives. It concerns whether to follow the teachings of a gentle but impotent Jesus or a wise old dictator who takes away men's freedom. So we can see that this is Yvonne who is telling the story. And behind Yvonne, she is the narrator of the novel. And behind that is Dostoevsky, who is the creator of this whole dilemma. And Yvonne gives us then the choice between a grand inquisitor who will treat us kindly and take care of us, and who is efficacious because he's a dictator. And we have the choice then of an impotent Christ who is good and who can perform individual miracles as we see with the little girl but who in the face of a dictatorship and of the argument that's put forward, the logical argument put forward by the Grand Inquisitor, the impotent Christ simply kisses the cheek of the Grand Inquisitor and goes away. So this is Yvonne's fable. And it's amazing that there's really been no one uh, who has seen this except me. And, and so pe people are beginning now, I think, to read Dostoevsky, uh, not simply as autobiography, but they're beginning to see that he was an artist and a craftsman. And so I have no doubt that they will uh, come around to, to see the structure of this novel. Now, this was written in 1880, and so it's Dostoevsky's amazing prophecy of 20th century totalitarianism didn't come about until 50 years later. And it makes us see how Yvonne, a non-believer, could write the article that was discussed in the monastery that we talked about last time. The article advocating that the church take over the state. Now this is exactly what happened with 20th century dictatorships. The state took on the character of a religion you had to believe in it. It was not just that you had to follow its laws, but under Stalin and under Hitler, under Mussolini for a while, one had to change one's mind and seem, at least, to accept the dogmas of the state. The state invaded not simply men's action to them, but their minds, their beliefs. No one had seen this possibility before Dostoevsky. But even further, Dostoevsky's whole treatment of this issue is a prophecy that pertains to our own epoch as governments assume more and more those things that have traditionally been left to home and church. The state begins to take on increasingly the role of a benevolent dictatorship. We have to read great fictions analogically and metaphorically, of course, but the prophetic insight is nonetheless there. So Ivan is obviously glad to be with his brother. He thinks, as he says, that it's best to get to know someone just before leaving. Now that's very revealing about him. 
because you don't have any consequences then. You don't have any obligations if you get to know him just before you leave. And Yvonne doesn't want any entanglements with human beings. He wants to be free for his own ideas. So he confesses to Agyosha on page 211 that he wants to drain the cup until he's 30. He shows us that he's not totally disillusioned. He gives us a statement about what he loves. But I want you to look at that very closely at the bottom of page 211. He says, I love the sticky little leaves as they open in spring. I love the blue sky. I love some people whom one loves, you know, sometimes without knowing why. I love some great deeds done by men, though I've long ceased perhaps to have faith in them. Now, what do you notice about that? Well, I think the first thing you notice is that it is highly exclusionary. He loves some things, some men. He loves the sticky little leaves when they open in the spring. So he loves pretty things. He loves the blue sky. But compare that with what Father Zosima teaches. Go back to page, I'll go forward to page 298. Line five. Father Zosima says, brothers, have no fear of men's sin. Love a man even in his sin. For well, that is the semblance of divine love, and it's the highest love on earth. Love all God's creation, the whole and every grain of sand in it. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things, and you will come at last to love the whole world with an all-embracing love. So this is a non-exclusionary love. And how different it is from Yvonne's. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. And Yvonne has said, I love the sticky little leaves when they open in spring. So Yvonne is a romantic, because what he has named for us is all the pretty things, the blue sky, and some men, and some great deeds. But he can't love anything ugly, or ordinary, or plain. And so we contrast, he thinks he's a great lover of mankind. And he thinks that he's angry at God because he loves mankind. And he feels for the children that suffer. So Iran is not aware that his love is preferential. But we are given Father Zosima, and we're meant to put all this together. And we need to remember Father Zosima's distinction to the lady of little faith, that distinction between love in action and love in dreams. And going on from his declaration of his preferential love, Ivan moves into his case against God, then at the bottom of page 216. He says, I don't accept this word of God's, and although I know it exists, I don't accept it at all. It's not that I don't accept God, you must understand. It's the world created by him. I don't and cannot accept. Let me make it plain. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for. But all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man. That in a world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, of all the blood they shed, 
that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that's happened. But though all that may come to pass, I don't accept it. And this is, this makes him awfully lovable, I think, that he, he puts himself against all the powers that be. And he says, I grant that it may all come to a final harmony, but I don't accept it. I won't accept this. Even if parallel lines do meet, and I see it myself, I shall see it and say they've met, but still I don't accept it. That's what is at the root of me, Alyosha. That's my thesis. I'm in earnest in what I say. And then he goes on to reveal what's in his disordered imagination, the suffering of children. And that has been the obsession of the 20th century. That terrible issue on which so many 20th century thinkers founded, how could a good God allow the suffering of innocence? Now, Iran's tales are horrible. The torture and murder of children in the very sight of their mothers. But as we notice, Iran has not himself been present at any of this suffering. All of what he tells us is compiled from what others have told him, or from pamphlets, or from newspapers. He has worked up a veritable dossier against God's justice. Now, it's interesting that all three of the brothers will come up against the suffering of a child. Their reaction to it will tell us a great deal about them. Alyosha will have to deal with an actual boy who's dying. Dmitri dreams of a crying babe, as he calls it, a child hungry and blue-faced from the cold, and it will change his life. Now, both of these brothers will accept that in some sense, they themselves are the target. It will not simply make them bitter, and the oppressors. Iran has compiled his list, and it makes him bitter. It makes him feel morally superior and leads him to build his case against the God of whom he disapproves, to whom he feels morally superior. Now, this has been the great disease of 20th century intellectuals, that they feel superior to any kind of religious belief because they think their moral sense is higher than that of any God that would allow the suffering of children. Now, Ivan has not seen an abused child, to our knowledge. As with everything else in life, he's removed from actual suffering. He's beset by ideas of suffering. It's an intellectual matter for him he can't bear the thought of it. We can see how prophetic he was of many current thinkers to whom the case against God is the suffering of children and the case against any kind of religious belief is what they may call a fanaticism. Ivan's tales are so excruciating that the gentle Alyosha must finally cry out why are you trying me? Will you say what you mean at last? And Yvonne says, of course I will. That's what I've been leading up to. You're dear to me. I don't want to let you go. And I won't give you up to your Zosima. So he goes on to build such a case against God that Alyosha finally has to murmur, that's rebellion. This is on page 226. And he looks down. He looks down because he's ashamed for Ivan. And Ivan replies by challenging his brother, imagine that you are creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving them peace and rest at last, but that it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature, that little child, 
big as this with its fist, for instance, and found your edifice on its unavenged tears, would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me, and tell the truth. No, I wouldn't consent, said our Rachel softly. Now we have to think about that a great deal because of course what Yvonne has done is misstate the whole situation. That if this edifice is of the world, the universe is founded on innocent suffering. If that was its intention from the beginning, but this, of course, is not the, the story that the Christian knows from the Bible. And it has been woven into his whole theology. The Christian knows that the world is fallen, but it's not as it was intended to be. And knows that mystery is a self is that suffering is a mystery. And that we can't understand it. And so I she says, no, I wouldn't consent. Now Yvonne thinks he's winning the argument, but he doesn't see with his statement. He's falsifies the situation, and that it's not corresponding to what the Christian considers the state of affairs to be. And then he goes on, and can you admit the idea that men for whom you're building it will agree to accept your happiness on the foundation of the unexpiated blood of a little victim and accepting it will remain happy forever? So you could be saying, how can there ever be happiness if this is allowed to happen on earth? The unexpiated blood of a little victim. No, I can't admit it, brother, said Andresha suddenly with flashing eyes. You said just now, is there a being in the whole world who would have the right to forgive and could forgive? But there is a being, and he can forgive everything, all and for all, because he gave his innocent blood for all and everything. You've forgotten him, so Agnosha thinks he's won the argument. And on him is built the edifice, and it's to him that they cry around, thou art just. Oh Lord, for it is to the Redeemer, the true one who sacrificed himself. Ah, the one says, the one without sin and his blood. No, I've not forgotten him. On the contrary, I've been wondering all the time how it was that you did not bring him in before. For usually all arguments on your side put him in the foreground. Usually you people get to him pretty soon, is what he means. And then Yvonne revealed that he's written a poem about him. And we recognize the bitterness behind this young idealist thought. Thinking about the sufferings of the world with a tender heart, such as Yvonne has, moved by pity, not love, has caused Yvonne to rebel and to try to fix the blame. So Dostoevsky is still dealing with that contrast that he gave us in the idiot, you know, between pity and love. So Ivan begins his tale in the time of the Inquisition in 16th century Spain. The people are all out in the streets for this to be an opera de fe, a burning of heretics, on page 229. He came softly, unobserved, and yet, strange to say, everyone recognized him. It is he, it is he, they explained. The stranger performs a public miracle. But we're first told he has a gentle smile of infinite compassion. A little girl lies in a coffin, hidden in flowers, on page 230. He looks with compassion, and in the eyes of the entire crowd, he performs a miracle. 
His lips softly pronounce, Maiden, arise. And the maiden arises. The little girl sits up in the coffin and looks around, smiling with wide open, wandering eyes, holding a bunch of white roses that they have put in her hand. I remember when I first read this passage, back when I first taught Russian novel at TCU many, many years ago, and it was with those white roses. But I knew that this is not the image that we have in the New Testament. It is not a genuine image. It is Iran's romanticized and sentimentalized image. So this is Iran's composition. Remember, he's made it all up. And he's reciting his poem to his brother, Alyosha. And his Christ begins to seem quite different from the one in the New Testament. Look at Luke. I'm thinking your mind back to Luke chapter 8, verse 49, where we have the account of Christ raising a child from the dead. We're told, when he reached the house, he would not let anyone come in with him, except Peter and James and John and the child's father and mother. So it's not in the sight of the whole crowd. He took the child by the hand and called aloud, rise up, maiden. And she rose up there and then with life restored to her. He ordered that she be given something to eat and warned her parents to let no one hear of what had befallen. Now that's our New Testament account of the raising of a child from the dead. Now in many other ways, Yvonne's Christ begins to seem like the sentimental version described by Renan, R-E-N-A-N, and Rousseau, and other 19th century thinkers. Ernest Renan wrote a book called To Be de Jesus, Life of Jesus which was published in 1863. It was the first biography of Jesus to present him as entirely human. And of course, in good 19th century sentimental fashion, as tender-hearted and pitying, it was launched on a world that was already much troubled with doubt about the supernatural. In less than six months, 60,000 copies of Renan's Life of Christ, Life of Jesus, were sold, with 23 editions of it appearing in the space of 20 years. Now, so there's a ferment going on on this very issue, and what I'm arguing is that Iran, being an intellectual, having had a Europeanized education, has encountered these ideas. 30 years earlier, there had been a publication by the German writer, David Strauss, which transformed Hegelianism, at least in the eyes of young philosophers, into the rival, if not the actual destroyer, of Christian orthodoxy. So now, I think people now are not reading Hegel in that way, but this is the way a group that called themselves the Young Hegelians uh, read him. In this work, the Christ of the Gospels was a myth generated out of the messianic longings of the Jews. Jesus actually existed, they said, but he was a good man rather than the incarnation of God. Here for the first time was a purely naturalistic biography of one whom Christendom had so long considered to be divine. So all this was going on. And then think back to Rousseau's position. According to Rousseau, Christianity preaches only servitude and dependence. Its spirit is so favorable to tyranny that it always profits by such a regime. True Christians, Rousseau said, are made to be slaves. And they know it. 
and do not much mind. This short life counts for, for too little in their eyes. The problem, as Rousseau notes, is that state and society without religion are an impossibility. So the problem is we've got to have religion in order for people to behave themselves in the state and in order to conduct the state well. That religion, however, according to Rousseau, cannot be Christianity. For if it is gospel Christianity, it's counterproductive to state interests. And if it is pagan Christianity, it is subversive of the state. And so Rousseau's solution to this alleged problem of a Christian state and citizenry is the replacement of Christianity with a civil religion, such as the Grand Inquisitor gives us, a purely civil profession of faith of which the sovereign should fix the articles. So the ruler of the state should fix the articles of the religion himself, not exactly as religious dogma, but as social sentiments without which a man cannot be a good citizen and a faithful subject. And I've been quoting Rousseau. And I'm, do, I'm doing this just to show you that these ideas are in the air and that we know that Dostoevsky was tremendously concerned with Hegel, that when he was in Siberia uh, and hard labor in Siberia, that he wrote to his brother asking for the full volume of everything that Hegel had written. And so he's thinking about these ideas. And so his character, Ivan, then would agree with Rousseau and the young Hegelians and Raymond that we need a religion for the state. We need someone like the Grand Inquisitor that can take care of us and feed us and give us the freedom to sin would simply take away our real freedom. And so it is Ivan who has been influenced because he is an intellectual. He's had a European education. So since civil government without religion is an impossibility, but also since Christianity is counterproductive to or subversive, of civil government, the state must impose its own religion, which occupies a merely utilitarian function. Now, I think that explains also what we were talking about last time, which is Yvonne's article saying that the church, the state should become the church. But all we'll have is a church. We won't have a civil state left any longer. And he's written an article on that. And it seemed strange for a young man who's really an agnostic to write that article until he put it together with these ideas that we must have a religion for the state to operate well. But that religion has to be administered by the political head of the state. So, back to Ivan's tale then. The Grand Inquisitor comes. The people fall down and worship him. He has a stranger come in prison. And then in the pitch darkness, the door of the prison is suddenly opened and the Grand Inquisitor himself comes in with a light in his hand. He's alone. And he says, is it thou? Thou? Don't answer. Be silent. Why hast thou come to hinder us? So the Grand Inquisitor still retains in himself some notion of the Messiah. But he doesn't want him around anymore. You had no right to come or to add anything to what you taught 
of old. Is he ironical? I know if you're asked. Is he jesting? And then later on page 239, Ayosha says, I don't quite understand the rhyme. What does it mean? Is it simply a wild fantasy or a mistake on the part of the old man? And Yvonne says, well, maybe he is the old man's mind. He might be obsessed. And the prisoner, too, is silent, Ayosha says. Does he look at him and not say a word? Now, the implication is that Ayosha finds the Christ in this fable, finds his behavior strange. And Yvonne says nothing, but goes ahead with his story reciting the charges that the Inquisitor makes against the prisoner. You gave men freedom, but you took away their happiness. For the first time, we have, after all these centuries, been able to give men happiness. Now this is the description of a totalitarian regime, such as they had not seen in the 19th century, but which we saw in Cuba. They cannot have happiness if they have freedom. And then we begin to understand. This is Yvonne's continuation of his argument that the church should take over the state. It's not really a picture of what has happened in the past. Yvonne is putting it back in the past. He fictionally places his action in the Spanish Inquisition. But it's a prediction. The Grand Inquisitor's regime, the danger and the eminence of which Dostoevsky sees the possibility, after all these centuries, will have all the powers of both church and state. It will feed people and will tell them that they can sin and will promise them a future life of happiness. All it will ask of them is their freedom. Now what we're seeing then, as I'm saying, is a prediction in allegorical form of state socialism, of a dictatorship such as the 20th century produced and the world had not before known. So you contrast that with traditional tyranny. The Russians have always lived under tyranny. They had tyrannical czars whom they loved always, despite the fact that the czars, you know, were many times murderous and, and terribly um, dictatorial but they never invaded their charges' minds. You know, they invaded their bodies and all of their political rights, but not their minds. They never attempted to make them believe anything that they did not believe. And so this is a new thing under the sun, and it has come about, of course, by people thinking that they can make people happy in this way. So to continue, the Grand Inquisitor said, you've had no lack of admonitions. The wise and dread spirit, the spirit of self-destruction and non-existence talked with thee in the wilderness and tempted thee. So he's saying the devil told you, you know, what would happen. And nothing all the wisdom of the earth could have invented could have equaled the wisdom of these three statements. The Grand Inquisitor said, page 233, turn these stones into bread, and mankind will run after thee like a flock of sheep, grateful and obedient. So if a regime feeds people, they'll follow. Go forever trembling, lest thou withdraw thy hand and deny them thy bread. In the end, they will lay their freedom at your feet, for they will come to understand that freedom and bread are incompatible. So if, you know, we cannot have a state in which there's no hunger if people are free. The only way we can eliminate hunger, he's saying, is to take away their freedom and manage efficiently. If the strong can give up bread and follow thee, what is to become of the tens of millions of creatures who will not have the strength to forego the earthly bread for the sake of the heavenly? Or do you care only for the 
strong and the very prisoner says we care for the weak too and let the charge against Christianity that Iran is making do you care only for the strong only for the ones that can live self selfless lives what about the weak we take care of everybody and then the second temptation cast yourself down you need public show in order to command the weak. Thou didst show man too much respect, but thou didst cease to feel for him. And now we realize that Iran is on the side of the inquisitor. The church must take over the state, as he had said in his article. It must not only take on the task of the economic system of feeding man, but must convince him by miracle, mystery, and quality that what he follows in following the state has the equivalent of divine sanction. Page 238. We are not working with me, but with him. That is our mystery. Now the inquisitor then is on the side of Satan, the tempter. Now, if you do any real research on devils, the demonic, and Satan, you'll find that it has been the tradition to hold that Satan is in charge of this world and is building a counter world to the world of grace. So this counter world that Satan is building, Dostoevsky would say, is this world of humanitarianism, this world that is not based on love, but is based on a kind of do-goodism, on pity. And that is the world that the devil is building. Now, you may think that's too extreme, but I think this is the implication of Dostoevsky's fiction in this final novel. And the Grand Inquisitor says, we are not working with me, but with him. We want to build a good world. So the Grand Inquisitor really does want to build a good world. That's our mystery. The Inquisitor is on the side of Satan, the tempter. And he thinks it was foolish of Christ not to follow what Satan offered him. Now, the third temptation is power. The kingdoms of the world. Oh, the work is only beginning, but it has begun. It has long to await completion, and the earth has yet much to suffer. But we shall triumph and shall be Caesars. So, now what he's brought up here is this double of the real world. The double that is shown to us by Gogol would say Patros. And Dostoevsky would say that too. It's what C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters reveal to us, the tawdriness of this other world that is being constructed by the powers of darkness. But the Grand Inquisitor says, and then we shall claim the universal happiness of man. And on page 240, he says to Christ, if anyone has ever deserved our fires, it is thou. Tomorrow I shall burn thee. And on page 241, but that's absurd, Alyosha cries, blushing. Who will believe you about freedom? Is that the way to understand it? That's not the idea of it in the Orthodox Church. That's wrong. And not even the whole of Rome is false. There could not be such a fantastic creature as your inquisitor. Who are these keepers of the mystery? We know the Jesuits they're spoken ill of, but surely they're not what you describe. There's no sort of lofty melancholy about it. Your suffering inquisitor is mere fantasy. So here is a young man in the Russian Orthodox Church who knows that even as badly as he thinks of the Western church, it's not this bad. This, is, this couldn't be a picture of anything real that calls 
is not Christianity. Your grand inquisitor does not believe in God. That's his secret. And then later on page 243, you don't believe in God. And he speaks this time very sorrowfully. Now Ivan goes on to complete his poem on page 243. He says, Christ suddenly approached the old man in silence and softly kissed him on his bloodless, aged lips. That was all his answer. The old man shuddered. His lips moved. He went to the door, opened it, and said to Christ, go and come no more. Come not at all. Never, never. And he led him out into the dark alleys of the town. And the prisoner went away. Now our problem is interpreting Dostoevsky's, not Ivan's, meaning. Ivan's is fairly obvious. One has to choose, Ivan would say, between head and heart. Now this is his dilemma. Because you see, in reality, Ivan loves the image of the gentle Jesus. But he has enough cynicism that he knows how impotent that Christ is. And so he's torn. And this poem that he has written is an objectification of his own uh, dilemma, his own dubious kind of choice that he has to make. It is not Dostoevsky's. Dostoevsky is certain, and I want in a minute to read a letter that he wrote that I think, and it's in your text, uh, verifies what he's doing. So our problem then is interpreting Dostoevsky's, not Ivan's meaning. Ivan's is fairly obvious. He's telling us we have to choose between our head or our heart. And so if we care about people, we'll choose the Grand Inquisitor. Because that Christ is lovely, but he's not powerful at all. And he will desert us. So the heart loves the gentle Jesus. But the head tells us that we have to be more practical. We have to think over society to protect these human beings who cannot look after themselves. But remembering that we're several degrees removed from Ivan's tail is harder. You see, we have to remember this is not Dostoevsky's way of doing it. So we have to ponder what Dostoevsky is saying here. We have to examine the meaning of Ivan's Christ leaving, leaving his people, his church, in the hands of the Grand Inquisitor, who does not stay to be burned. He doesn't fall to the earth and die, except the grain of wheat falls to the earth and die, it abideth alone, you know, we're told at the beginning of the novel. So the kiss glows in the Grand Inquisitor's heart. But the old man adheres to his idea. And Alyosha says bitterly, and you with him? You too? Alyosha argues with Ivan. So on page 244, he got up, went to Ivan, and softly kissed him on the lips. That's plagiarism, cried Ivan, highly delighted. You stole that from my poem. Thank you, though. Now, Alyosha is not capable at this stage of his life of refuting Ivan. Alyosha is still the good and sweet person that has remained naive. Though he knows that something's wrong with Ivan's interpretation of Christ and Christianity, He's not capable of refuting it. Now on page 761 in your text is a letter that Dostoevsky wrote to a friend 
saying that he risked everything in placing his answer to Iran in the life and teachings of the elder Zoshima. So read, let's read that letter. On 761, the last four lines of the page. He says, I propose to make the sixth book, the Russian monk, the answer to that whole negative side. And for that reason, I tremble for it in this sense. Will it be answer enough? The more so as it's not a point for point answer to the propositions previously expressed. And he means in the grand inquisitor. It's but an oblique one. Will it be understood? And will I achieve anything of my aim? So Dostoevsky has risked everything on this portrait of Zosima. And yet he could not, as an artist, make Zosima dramatic in the same way that the Grand Inquisitor is, or that Ivan is, because Zosima is quiet and self-effacing. But what he has done, and this seems to me remarkable, is that he has allowed Ayosha to tell the elder story. And if you look closely at the way the preface in which Ayosha, with which Ayosha uh, begins his account. It's uncannily close to the way in which the gospel writers work. So I think Dostoevsky is consciously imitating the style of the gospel writers here. Now Dostoevsky wants to show the shallowness of Ivan's point of view, but he has to do justice to it. So he allows him to ask this terrible question. Does the Christian way work? Does it indeed promote the life more abundant that the Christ of the New Testament promised? Or is it beautiful and impotent? As a forerunner of state socialism, Ivan does not take into account in his judgment of Christianity. Three, four, elements of Christianity that this novel presents for us. Forgiveness of sins. See, because the Grand Inquisitor accuses Christ of coming only for the strong. Only the strong can follow you. Only the strong can be sinless. Only the strong can give up bread but forgiveness means that the weak, the sinners, are included. Mercy. See, forgiveness is for those who repent and try to be different. Mercy is for those who don't repent. And there's mercy even for them. And there's grace, which changes people. That's the meaning of grace so that the little people that the Grand Inquisitor is concerned with are changed. And above all, the active love of which Zosima has spoken, which accomplishes the transformation of the human person. Active love is harsh and dreadful. But it gradually gives you an inner certainty. And so it is this active love to which Zosima testifies. And so the answer to the Grand Inquisitor is in Zosima's life and his teachings. Alyosha has put together the sermon that Father Zosima gave on his death day, but he has 
gone back over a period of several months' conversation with Father Zosima in order to do it. And so if you would look closely at that beginning, that introduction, I'm not going to read it for you this evening, but read it with, in mind, uh, its similarity to the way in which the New Testament writers proceeded. That is, some things were said in actuality, the direct quote. Others were said at other times and put together. And so it's a, it's a bringing together of the sort of um, compilation that we have in the New Testament. So Father Zosima, then at the time of his death, has Alyosha by his side. Though remember that Father Zosima told Alyosha, and Alyosha is under commitment to obey the elder, he said, look after your brothers. Be with your brothers. Because Father Zosima has known, particularly, that Dimitri is in serious trouble. You remember that Father Zosima bowed down, gave a low bow to Dimitri in that meeting in the cell, in the monastery. And that was a sign that he recognized that Dimitri would have terrible suffering ahead of him. So he's told Alyosha, he's commanded him to be near your brothers. And Alyosha has not done it because he wanted to be with his elder when he died. But if we are to think he was supposed to obey the elder, then he has done something wrong. But it has given us this beautiful account of Father Zosima. So at the time of the elder's death, our Lisha has hurried to his side and has taken down all he says, and he later put it together with what he had already compiled. <coughs> the author speaks of this method on page 265, and I'd like you to be sure to read it closely, because he explains that though it reads like a sequence in actuality, it was interrupted many times, with Alyosha writing it all down later, after the elder's death. Now what we've been hearing from Ivan is a poem, as he calls it, that shows the two forms of his own personal dilemma. The enlightened westernized socialist, who wishes to remove suffering and hardship from the world by taking away human freedom, And in delivering this prophetic fable, Ivan has in attempted to give us his interpretation of the Christian ideal, the meek Christ who places compassion above the stern, authoritative, and transfiguring, transfiguring caritas, charity, love of the New Testament. Now, Father Zosima embodies that active love in this novel. And Alyosha is learning. It begins in valuing persons, persons. See, not just categorize them, but valuing them as persons. It discards all false sentimentality, all self-serving ideas of virtue. It risks, it dares, it has a strength, a sense of merriment. You see, Father Zosima has a merriment to him. It has forgiveness and joy. And by the end of the novel, our Alyosha will be strong and authoritative, and his timidity will be transformed into efficacy. So he will be efficacious. <coughs> but at this state, he is as yet untried. He, too, leaves the scene of suffering. You know, in the same way that the cross of the Grand Inquisitor does. That is, his kiss is symbolic of his being like this Christ that Ivan is talking about. He hasn't matured yet. 
His elder had commanded him, as I say, to stay close to his brothers and promises that he will not die without Alyosha beside him. But Alyosha was the kind of hero worship of the immature person. He's unwilling to stay away from his elder, and thus he deserts not only Ivan, but Dmitri. And he takes no responsibility at all for Snegikov. So we shall see the results of his desertion. And this is a, a, a considerably uh, bad offense because it disobeys his elder and because he should be looking after his brothers anyhow. So the murder of the old Karamasa, the murder of the father, occurs during this time that Alyosha should be being his brother's keeper. Now he rushes to the elder's side and takes down his words. And then after Zosima's death, he puts all of it together. Zosima had in his childhood been influenced by the death of his brother, Marco, who in his last illness sees everything as blessed and enunciates the great theme of the novel. Each is responsible for all. Marco asks the birds for forgiveness because if he had been better, he knows the birds would have been happier. But Zosima, despite this sacred memory, which is like Alyosha's memory of his mother, you remember the narrator tells us that one good memory will be enough to get us through the terrible things in life if we have one good memory. And Alyosha had this memory of his mother. And Zosima had this memory of his dying brother, Marco. But despite this memory, Zosima falls into a life of selfishness and riot. As an army officer, he gets himself into a situation of having to face a duel. On the night before, he struck his valet in the face, and the man simply stood without raising his hands to protect himself at all. So the man stands and lets himself be struck in the face. The next morning, Zosima awakes with a heavy heart, and he knows that it's because he struck his servant. He goes down on his knees before him and apologizes. Proceeds with the duel, but does not fire a shot. And afterward, he enters a monastery. And he begins the process of coming to know Christ. His sermon is one of the high points of the novel. Powerful not only because of its content, but also because of Dostoevsky's artistry in crafting it as he does. We know Zosima intimately from several angles before we hear his teachings, and so we believe him because he has been a sinner, he's been disgraceful, he's been cruel, his heart has been touched, he's come out of darkness into this light, and we know that he knows what he's talking about. So the sermon begins on page 292, and it continues through page 302, and this is the heart of the novel. Though it is less dramatic, of course, than the Grand Inquisitor section, and people don't pay attention to this sermon the way Dostoevsky hoped that they would. It's an amazing and unique work in literature. Framed as it is by all that we already know of the elder, including as it does his early life of wildness and riot, it's a convincing homily. If we give our attention to it, it's likely to change our lives. It did mine. For Dostoevsky's method as a novelist reaches deep into the psyche in a way that few other writers have accomplished. 
So Sima speaks first of the monastic way, which involves sacrifice. But as he says, it's through self-denial and prayer that Russia will be saved. And remember, we mean the world. And it's a Russia, and it's not humanity. And then on page 298, he goes into his most powerful lines. He says, brothers, have no fear of man's sin. Love a man, even in his sin. For well, that is the semblance of divine love. And it's the highest love on the earth. Love all God's creation, the whole and the every grain of sand. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. And as we've done, already done, we have to put this together with his earlier remarks about active love. But it's different from love in dreams. That in fact, active love may be harsh and dreadful, but that without fail, it transforms the person that loves. Remember he said, this is certain. This has been tried. Sometimes, he says, we are perplexed at the sight of sin, and we wonder whether to use force or humble love. And he says, always decide to use humble love. If you resolve on that once for all, you may subdue the whole world. And then he goes on to say, brothers, love is a teacher, but one must know how to acquire it, for it's hard to acquire. It's dearly bought. It's won slowly by long labor, for we, we must love not only occasionally, for a moment, but forever. And then he says, everyone can love occasionally, even the wicked can. I remember pondering that so long and realizing the truth in it. You know, we like to think that wicked people don't love at all. But even the wicked people that we think are so bad and that get in our way and stop us from doing what we think is right, we have to think even they can love occasionally. And on page 299, he says, my friends, pray to God for gladness. Do not say sin is mighty, and wickedness is mighty, and evil environment is mighty. Fly from that dejection, children. There is only one means of salvation. Take yourself and make yourself responsible for all men's sins. And you will see at once that it really is so, and that you are to blame for everything and for all things. You know, that takes a little bit of thinking. <laughs> but it's a kind of intuition that we've all had, I think. You know, that feeling that when we're finding our world so terrible and that kind of the, the arrow comes and points, it's you, you know. <laughs> It's you that is at odds with everything. And then at the bottom of the page, much on earth is hidden from us. But to make up for that, we've been given a precious mystic sense of our living bond with the other world, with the higher heavenly world. And the roots of our thoughts and feelings are not here, but in other worlds. God took seeds from different worlds and sowed them on this earth, and his garden grew up. What grows and lives is alive only through its contact with other mysterious worlds. Now, if that feeling grows weak or is destroyed in you, that feeling of connection with other worlds, the heavenly growth will die away in you. And then you will be indifferent to life and even grow to hate it. 
So he's talking about the, the sacramental vision, our realization that the material world is connected to a spiritual reality. Page 300. <coughs> Remember that you can't be a judge of anyone. If I had been righteous myself, perhaps there would be no criminal standing before me. And then this command, work without ceasing. If you remember something in the night, rise up at once and do it. As I say, rise up and make a list. <laughs> that <laughs> I lose me the next day. <laughs> he says, if the evil doing of men moves you to indignation, now this is wonderful, This we need this, look at it. If the evil doing of men moves you to indignation and overwhelming distress, even for a desire for vengeance on the evil who are shown above all things that be, go at once and seek suffering for yourself, as though you were yourself guilty of that wrong. And even though your light was shining and it seems to have no effect, hold firm and doubt not the power of the heavenly light. If the ones you intended it for are not saved, then their sons will be saved. And if not, then someone else. You are working for the whole. You are acting for the future. When you're left alone, pray. Love all men. Love everything. Now, the elder dies sooner than was expected. And thus, Timothy he has used this phrase for several people before. Remember, Marie dies sooner than was expected. If of it does. But now the elder is not at all like those others. So does he mean anything by this phrase? I don't know. I leave that with you. What the implications are. And in accordance with miraculous events that have happened before in the monastic tradition, it is thought that when a saint dies, his body does not decay. So everyone in the monastery and in the town is expecting a miracle. And one of the themes of the novel, which the author comments on several times, is that miracles, you remember, do not produce faith. But that faith produces miracles. It's quite the other way around. Now it's not long after the elder's death that people begin opening windows in the room where he lies in his coffin. The town has been excited about the prospect of having a saint among them. And they've all just assumed that God owes it to Father Zosima because he's been so good. And so they think they'll have the distinction. You know, our monastery has a, a saint in it. You know, because, and his body will not decay. Now that was not an infallible rule at all. It happens sometimes in the history of Russian monasticism. But they think it is their due. And his enemies, of course, are delighted when there begins to be an odor. So the town has been excited about the prospect, and the atmosphere is almost one of carnival. But of the unexpected occurrence of his body's beginning to purify. Everyone is agog. Malicious remarks are made. And Father Farapont, the pious hypocrite, is delighted. He thinks he's vindicated. And Madame Holocaust declares, who would have expected such conduct from him? <laughs> I didn't expect Father Lucina to behave this way. <laughs> Alyosha is mortified. But more, he's angry and indignant, not only at the gossips, but at God. God has been unjust. 
of the Shafiyyah. And he finds himself repeating some of his brother Yvonne's lines. He says, I must have justice. His spiritual ordeal is beginning. He positively seeks to rebel. He decides to go with the seminarian Rakitin, who's a kind of image of the demonic. Rakitin is ironic and mean-spirited. So he decides to go with Rakitin to the house of Roshenka, a beautiful young woman who is thought to be of easy virtue, the one with whom both Dimitri and his father are smitten. And Dimitri really loves her, as we know. And his suffering over his engagement to Katerina, plus the fact that he has no money with which to woo Roshenka, is a harrowing experience for him. So at the same time, that Avyosha is committing his sin of rebellion, Dimitri is working himself up to a frenzy of jealousy against his father. He plans to go to him and demand his inheritance. Now at Rushika's, Avyosha is becoming more and more enmeshed. He eats sausage and drinks vodka during Lent. Serious sin. Grushinka is sitting on his lap when Rakita makes a callous remark about Ayosha's elder stinking. And the young woman is horrified. Is Osima dead? She exclaims, I didn't know. And she jumps off Ayosha's lap and shows that she obviously grieves with him over his loss. And the two comfort each other like brother and sister and redeem each other. There's a great scene of joy between them. And she tells the tale of, the folk tale about the onion. You know, the tale of the old woman who's in the lake of fire in hell. And her angel comes to her because in the Russian folklore, your angel will come to you even in hell and try to get you out of hell. And so the angel asks the old woman if she can remember any good deeds she ever did. And the old woman thinks a long time and finally says, well, I did give away an onion once. <laughs> and so the angel gets the onion. It would have to be a green onion because it would have to be a tail to it. And the angel gets the onion and begins pulling the old woman out of the lake of fire. And other souls that are in the in hell want to get out too and so they try to hold on and the old woman fights them away. She's selfish, you see, even in hell. And the onion breaks and so she doesn't get out of hell. And the moral, of course, is that if you're that selfish, you know, you belong in hell. So Grushika tells that story and they use that story um, again several times to say, I did give away an onion once. And it makes a nice little thing, a little remark in one's life. You know, when you're thinking how bad you've been about things, you can say, well, I did give away an onion once. If you can think of a good deed. <laughs> so Ayosha goes back to the monastery in a different frame of mind because Rashika has shared his grief and they have loved each other as brother and sister. And he realizes how good-hearted she is. And so he listens to the reading of the gospel story of the marriage feast at Cana. Now for Dostoevsky, that the story of the marriage feast is central, it seems to me. And the imagery of marriage. You know, remember in The Idiot, remember the death of our beautiful woman who is the bride that should be the lovely living bride and with her two bridegrooms sitting beside her, the dead bride. So I think Dostoevsky is very much concerned with the whole imagery of the bridal feast. And so what Alyosha hears being read is the marriage feast of Cana. And he falls into a dream in which his beloved elder comes to him on page 239. Yes, he came up to him 
to him. He, the little thin old man, with tiny wrinkles on his face, joyful and laughing softly. Yes, my dear, I'm cold too, cold and bitten. Why have you hidden yourself here? Out of sight. You come and join us too. He speaks to him kindly, tells him that he's at the marriage feast and that the beloved is there. And then he says, the little elder in the dream or the vision, says, begin your work, dear one. Begin your work, gentle one. Do you see our son? Do you see him? I dare not look, whispered Alyosha, but something glowed in Alyosha's heart. This is page 340. Something filled it till it ached. Tears of rapture rose from his soul. He stretched out his hands, uttered a cry, and woke up. Now remember our epigraph. You know, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And so what we have is all three of the brothers who will fall to the earth and die in their own way. This is Alyosha's death. Because he, he deliberately sinned. And we can laugh about his rebellion and not think it was very serious. Because he didn't murder anybody. You know, but he turns against God. And he wants to turn against all his religious teachings. He wants to eat sausage during that. He wants to go to the house of this fallen woman, you know, and not for any good purposes. So Arusha did fall. But now what he gains is a vision. And so all three of the brothers, when they fall to the earth and die in their own way, are given some kind of extrasensory experience. And you'll see with Ivan the way in which his manifests itself. But for Alyosha, it's, it's this vision that he's given. So something glowed in Alyosha's heart, we're told on page 340. Something filled it to the eight. Tears of rapture rose from his soul. He stretched out his hands, uttered a cry, and woke up. Suddenly he turned sharply and went out of the cell. He did not stop on the steps, but went quickly down, his soul overthrowing, overflowing, yearned for freedom, space, and openness. And now here's, I suppose, the most beautiful passage in the novel, from page 340. The vault of heaven, full of soft, shining stars, stretched vast and fathomless above him. The Milky Way ran in two pale streams from the zenith to the horizon. The white towers and golden domes of the cathedral gleamed out against the sapphire sky. The silence of earth seemed to melt into the silence of the heavens. The mystery of earth was one with the mystery of the stars. So this is meant to give us that sense of absolute wholeness, the wholeness between the spiritual world and the physical world. So that for Alyosha, all of it comes together in a vision of beauty. So he falls to the earth and embraces it. And this is the climax the Alyosha's ordeal, which on the surface may seem slight in comparison with those of Ivan and Dmitri, which we haven't yet encountered. But for Alyosha, the rebellion has been a serious matter. The challenge to his faith has been real. He's followed the path of human love, loyalty to his elder, but with a touch of possessive ego in that love. He's thought God owed him something. 
He wasn't thinking so much of his elder as of himself. And the elder has earned the right to be demonstrably seen as a saint, is what our worship is thinking. So, for this rebellion, our worship has suffered, was broken, and given new life. He'll be a different character. We're told he fell to the earth, a some kind of boy, I forgot what the adjective is, a weak boy, but he rises a resolute champion. And as you'll see in the latter part of the novel, he deals with young people now with authority. He has strength and advocacy. He'll be a different character in the rest of the novel, strong and resolute and mature, still sweet and empathetic, non-judgmental, but able to take on a group of boys and teach them with authority, correcting them when necessary. Now, Dimitri's ordeal is heavier. He rushes to the garden at the Karamazov place. He sees his father on the balcony. He intends to strike him and kill him, but he strikes old Grigory instead by mistake. Not knowing whether he has killed the old man, he rushes from the place, hires a driver, races toward Mokro, where Grushinka is waiting for the Polish man who had betrayed her in her earlier life, her Pole, as she calls him. She's convinced that she still loves this man who had deserted her. And on the way, Dimitri is wild and almost delirious. The driver is frightened of him. See page 389. Dimitri says, Andre, a simple soul. Will Dmitry Fyodorovich Karamazov go to hell? And the driver says, I don't know, sir. It depends on you. Well, you, are, you see, sir, when the Son of God was nailed on the cross, he went straight down to hell from the cross and set free all sinners that were in agony. And the devil groaned because he thought he'd get no more sinners in hell. And God said to him then, don't groan, for you shall have all the mighty of the earth. <laughs> the rulers, the chief judges, and the rich men, and shall be filled as you've never as you've been in all the ages till I come again. Those were his very words. <laughs> to, which, to which Dimitri replied scornfully, a peasant legend. So you see, sir, who is his, his hell is for? Now what he was really saying is, you're not going to hell because you're not really rich and powerful. And hell is made for rich and powerful people. So you see, sir, who it is hell's for. But you're like a little child. That's how we look on you. And though you're hasty tempered, sir, yet God will forgive you for your kind heart. And you, do you forgive me, Andre? What should I forgive you for, sir? You've never done me any harm. No, for everyone, for everyone. You here alone on the road, will you forgive me? For everyone, speak, simple peasant heart. Now, Dmitri is a romantic, you know, and he, this love of the peasant um, that has happened in Russia in the 19th century thought, and we'll see it so strongly in Tolstoy. So Dmitri thinks, if Andre, if one soul, and particularly if a peasant, can forgive me, then perhaps there's hope for me. And the peasant is frightened. He says, oh, sir, I feel afraid of driving you. Your talk is so strange. But Dimitri no longer hears the driver. He's praying intensely for forgiveness. I'm a wretch, but I love thee. If thou sendest me to hell, I shall love thee there. And from there I shall cry out that I love thee forever and ever. Now his passionate soul is so fully possessed by eros that his love and joy and repentance encompass the whole world. It's an erotic love that Dimitri has for the whole world and for God. But his is not yet, nor is it ever within the novel. The active, harsh, and dreadful love of which Zosima has spoken. But Dimitri is on the way. At the end at Mako, 
Brigitte has become disillusioned with her former lover. She realizes that she loves Dimitri. The two are united just at the moment that the police arrive and arrest Dimitri for the murder of his father. Someone has killed Fyodor. Dimitri is amazed at not being treated as a gentleman should be treated. He's accused of stealing money as well as of murdering his father. And you see, to an aristocrat, murder is not a disgraceful sin, but stealing is. And so when they accuse him of stealing, Dimitri wants to say, what do you take me for? You know, even though he's saying, I killed a man. He reiterates that he struck Gregory, but then he did not go to his father. Nevertheless, he's taken away to jail to begin his ordeal of falling to the earth and dying. And it will be for him, as well as for the other two, in an image, a dream, that shows him the truth. Now, let's stop a minute to think about this. What can turn you aside if you have a wrong idea? See, not logic, not reason, because the mind itself, if it is going in one direction, convinces itself and it can't be reached by reason. And so the person has to be reached in some other way. And so what Dostoevsky shows us is that it is an image. It's, it's a, a dream or a vision or a hallucination that is able to show the person the wrongness of his ways, which no amount of reasoning would do. And in the pattern of this novel's action, Dostoevsky makes us see that these images can set people straight because they are like icons. They are something that appeal to their hearts, their imaginations, their inner vision of things. And so Ayosha's experience has been an iconic one an image of the beloved elder. And just think of that dream that comes to him, the beloved elder at the marriage feast in heaven and all the saints around him. It's like an icon that has appeared to him surrounded by the blessed at the feast in heaven. And Dimitri, too, will be set straight in a dream by an iconic image of a babe crying and of a mother holding a child, a Madonna and child, both blue-faced from the cold and hunger. Yvonne's ordeal will be harder and more problematic. We're not certain how he will turn out, but the one thing we're certain of in this portion of this remarkable novel is that Father Zosima's way has been convincingly shown to be efficacious. Yvonne has doubted whether people can take care of themselves without some powerful protector, a dictator. In answer to this, Alyosha and Rushinka have had the inner strength to save each other. And thinking back on our experience with Father Zosima, we remember the woman who walked four miles, carrying a baby, to bring the monk something, not to ask for something, but to give. It's this rich texture of the poor and humble that gives strength to Father Zosima's words and refutes Ivan's picture of a weak Jesus in his bitter allegory about the Grand Inquisitor. Now, in the midst of this polyphonic dialogical novel, where voices cross over to each other, two long monologues enter into argument with each other in the noosphere, above the general action, Yvonne's impersonation of a Grand Inquisitor's dry and loveless voice, combating the warm, affectionate tones of an Alyosha, recounting with an overflowing heart the life and times of his beloved editor. So look at this, what we've done in this hall now is that we're going to have long passages of uh, like the digression on the life of the elder. 
the trial of the victory, the Grand Inquisitor section. But so far, what we've got is the Grand Inquisitor confronting the Sima with the two younger men. And so we see this arrangement uh, with this prosaic passages explaining above the action. So Dostoevsky makes all the structures of reality available to us, almost as certainly as Dante does. Something visited me in that hour, Alyosha was later to declare, and we know he means an angelic presence. Now we'll finish the novel next time to discover how embarrassingly tawdry is Yvonne's visitor from that other world. Thank you.